Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for uh, joining us this afternoon. I want to thank uh, Mark Sneer for, uh, first, a wonderful introduction, and second, for the invitation to be here. I also want to thank my colleague, Dan Peterson, who is a graduate of this school and is now at Google, who helped to arrange uh, my schedule so that I could join you this afternoon. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed to tell you that I'm using uh, PowerPoint slides, and I have a new motto that says, power corrupts, and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. Uh, but there are some photographs and other images that I wanted to share with you, and this seemed like one way to do it. Let me start out by um, telling you a little bit about my title at Google. I'm the chief internet evangelist of the company. When I first went to work for them, they said, what title do you want? And I said, well, how about Archduke? And uh, then someone pointed out to me that uh, the last Archduke was Ferdinand, and he was assassinated in 1914, and it started World War I. So maybe that's not a good idea. Meanwhile, uh, uh, Eric Schmidt and uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin all suggested that uh, I ought to be the chief internet evangelist, because that's what I've been spending my uh, career doing, is trying to get people to build more internet. So I thought, well, with a title like that, on my first day of work, I should show up in something reasonably ecclesiastical. So what you're seeing is, in fact, uh, the formal academic robes of the University of the Balearic Islands in uh, Palma, Mallorca, Spain. Um, they, they were very kind to give me an honorary degree. You know, that's honoris causa in Latin. It means you didn't earn this. Uh, in, in any case, uh, they let me keep the robes as well. So that's what I wore on my first day of work, and Eric Schmidt took the picture. Well, let's jump in. I want to start out by giving you just a quick glimpse of where the internet is today. Um, you can see that if we were here 10 years ago, I would be touting the 22 million servers that were on the internet, not counting laptops and desktops that might be episodically connected, and 50 million users. 10 years later, there are, well, in fact, nine years later, there were almost 400 million hosts. I don't actually have the data for January 2007 um, yet, so I'm going to have to dig that up. My guess is there are probably about 500 million or more servers on the network, not counting desktops, laptops, personal digital assistants, and other internet-enabled devices, and over a billion users. Now, at the same time that the internet's been growing during that 10-year period, something else has been happening in the telecom world, and that is the, um, uh, the introduction of about 2.5 billion mobile devices. Uh, these are uh, not just telephones, they're programmable devices, and many of them are internet-enabled already. The implication of that is that for many people in the world, their first introduction to internet may very well be through a mobile rather than through a laptop or a desktop. So that's having a significant impact on the direction in which internet applications are heading because they have to accommodate some of the constraints of those devices. I thought you might find it amusing to go back to those days of yesteryear before the internet when the first large-scale packet switch network was built, sponsored by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Uh, the first four nodes were uh, at UCLA, uh, SRI International in the uh, Menlo Park Bay Area and San Francisco area, UC Santa Barbara, and the University of Utah. Of course, later on, uh, Champaign-Urbana campus uh, and the National Center for Supercomputer Applications became very, very important parts of that network. I was a graduate student at UCLA in 1969 responsible for programming the Sigma 7, the one at the lower uh, bottom here, which, which was the first of the computers to be connected to the ARPANET. Its job was to actually measure the traffic of the network, to inject fake traffic, to, uh, to gather statistics to compare with the queuing models that Professor Leonard Kleinrock had developed when he was a graduate student at MIT, and then brought that research with him to UCLA. So the Sigma-7 is, uh, is in a museum now. Uh, some people have suggested I should be there too, uh, but I hope that I'm still able to contribute uh, a little bit to the continued evolution of this system. Well, if we fast forward 30 years in time, the internet looks like that in 1999, about all you can tell from this is that it got bigger, it got more connected, and it got more colorful. In fact, there are something like a quarter of a million networks that are all interconnected, if you count everything, including you know, the local networks that you have at home or in school or in the office, uh, possibly even more networks than that. Uh, so it's become a very, very large-scale infrastructure. 
one of the other interesting things to look at is where the users are. Now, if we were having this discussion 10 years ago, the bulk of the users would have been in North America. Today, what you find is that the largest single grouping of users is in Asia. It shouldn't be too surprising because that includes China and India and Japan and uh, Indonesia and so on. 56% of the world's population falls into the Asian category. So not only are they the largest single group today, but they will continue to be and become absolutely uh, the largest uh, element on the internet. That has all kinds of implications for uh, content, for example, languages that are used, uh, perhaps styles of interaction uh, and kinds of interests that, that the people have. So that's going to be a very strong influence on the way in which the internet evolves. Europe is the next largest grouping. Of course, Europe keeps redefining itself by adding more countries. Uh, so uh, they just added uh, a few more, including Bulgaria, which means that Cyrillic is now an official European language, uh, or Cyrillic is a European alphabet. Uh, and uh, that has, uh, again, an impact on the way in which the internet evolves because of the need for representation of so many new languages and new alphabets and new symbol sets. Uh, probably the most difficult part of the net to um, help uh, evolve is Africa, where there are at least a billion people on the continent, but at the time these data were produced in early January, uh, only about 33 million users, and most of them would be found in North Africa, in Egypt, in uh, Tunisia, in Morocco, or in uh, South Africa. Uh, although it's true that every country in Africa does have some internet access, frequently it's in the capital city, often it might be in the major university in the capital city, uh, with the rest of the continental infrastructure still very light, in many cases uh, produced by satellite as opposed to uh, fiber linkages. So there's still a lot of work to be done uh, in that part of the world. And in spite of the big numbers, uh, a billion users seems like a big number, until you realize that's only one-sixth of the world's population. So the internet evangelist at Google feels like he has a long way to go to get another five and a half billion people up on the net. My estimate is, though, that there will be on the order of three billion people on the net by the end of 2010. A significant fraction of them will be on by way of internet-enabled mobiles. And we could argue over how well connected that is, but uh, there will be at least some capability through those devices to interact uh, with network-based resources. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, the technology that's shaping the network and has shaped it and will be shaping it. When Bob Kahn and I were first doing this design, it was 1973. We'd had four years of experience with the ARPANET and with packet switching. We were fully convinced that packet switching was, in fact, a highly successful technology for computer communication, that it was better suited than the traditional circuit switching of the telephone system. Uh, he, uh, when Bob Kahn came to visit me at Stanford University, where I had a, a lab that was starting to do research on uh, networking, uh, he pointed out that, uh, that the military was interested in having computers in use in command and control. And for that to be realistic, these machines had to be, computers had to be available in uh, mechanized infantry, had to be available in ships at sea, as well as fixed locations. So that meant Im implicitly that we needed mobile radio capability and we needed satellite capability for ship to ship and ship to shore. We had the wireline demonstration of the ARPANET to show that it was feasible in those contexts. But his problem when, uh, when he showed up at Stanford was to get networks that were all packet switched but using these different media to interwork uh, in a uniform uh, way that was essentially transparent to the computers that were at the edges. Uh, at the time, uh, we realized that we didn't know what new transmission and switching technologies would be invented after we finished the design of Internet. So we coined a, uh, a general um, principle, which was that the Internet packets of the Internet protocol layer should run on virtually any transmission and switching system that would deliver a bag of bits from point A to point B with some probability greater than zero. That's all we asked of the underlying transmission system. Everything else that delivered things in sequence and recovered from loss and things of that sort would happen at higher layers of protocol at the end of the net. Now, in order to emphasize this idea of, uh, of getting everything to work on top of any communication system, I had a t-shirt made that said, IP on everything. And that's basically what I've been doing for the last 35 years, is trying to make sure the internet protocol actually works on virtually any transmission system. 
Now that we've gotten to the point where it's a very widespread protocol, I think I need a new t-shirt because people are assuming that it's there and they're building new layers of protocol on top. So I think my new t-shirt should say IP under everything. Now, one of the things that I hadn't fully appreciated is that this internet layer of protocol had another feature to it uh, that uh, has profoundly shaped the evolution of the net. And that feature is that the packets don't know what they're carrying. So they literally don't, they know they're carrying a bag of bits, but they don't know how to interpret them. So the internet layer doesn't know what the applications are. It doesn't know if it's carrying a piece of a web page or part of email or possibly a digitized audio or video signal. All it knows is moving bits from A to B. The result is that the net is almost exclusively an end-to-end -end construct. The underlying network component delivers chunks of data, packets, but everything else does the actual application at the edge. So this end-to-end -end principle has been used to evolve new applications on the net without having to ask permission of or to make changes to the underlying network infrastructure, except possibly for increased capacity in order to carry larger amounts of data or to deliver lower latency. But the networks themselves that make up the internet are not sensitive to the applications that they're running. Uh, this has led to a concept called network neutrality, which says that the net is essentially um, insensitive to the applications and that the operators of the network should be equally insensitive to whose data is being moved around. This is not an argument that says you shouldn't be able to prioritize, prioritize uh, a packet. That's not the issue. The issue is that you don't want to um, uh, change the way in which you offer service by uh, discriminating between one supplier of, uh, of an application and another. Everyone should have equal access to the network and if it's necessary that some of the packets have priority because they're trying to do a low latency application, then anyone who needs that should be able to get it. If we don't do that, we end up with a real problem because the, uh, the people who are providing broadband internet services potentially could decide that they would discriminate against competitors who are offering competing higher level services that are also riding over the same underlying infrastructure. And I think that would be a constraint on user choice because that would inhibit users from getting applications from virtually anywhere in the internet if it were in fact limited to or favored only those services coming from the underlying broadband service provider. Radio clearly supplies mobility and that's having a significant impact on the net. High speed is, is uh, provided by fiber or cable uh, modems or DSL uh, over twisted pair. And certainly as we uh, contemplate the run out of IP version 4 address space, which I'll remind you was uh, standardized in 1977, uh, we now need to consider IP version 6, which has 128 bits of address space, which uh, if you do the math is 340 trillion 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 addresses. I used to go around saying that that meant every electron in the universe could have its own web page if it wanted, until I got an email from somebody at Caltech uh, who said, Dear Dr. Surf, you jerk, there's 10 to the 88th electrons in the universe and you're off by eight, 50 orders of magnitude. So I don't say that anymore. Uh, nonetheless, uh, that's a lot of address space and it should be enough to last until after I'm dead and then it's somebody else's problem. Uh, Broadband is a big issue uh, for two reasons. First of all, there isn't enough of it, and there are not enough competing suppliers of it. So you're kind of stuck. Uh, the FCC statistics say that 60% of the country may have a choice of either cable or DSL. 30% of the country has a choice of one or the other, but not both, so there's no competition there. And 10% of the country doesn't have any choice because there isn't any broadband at all, in, possibly in the rural parts of the country. Uh, to make matters worse, the broadband that's supplied is asymmetric. The implication of that is that uh, you may be capable of receiving high resolution video, as may be your partner on someplace else on the net. Neither of you are capable of sending that high resolution video because of the asymmetry of the broadband service. So my prediction is that this is a temporary stopping point, that the demand will be very strong in the, in the uh, consumer sector for symmetric broadband capability. It's what you get in the business world when you get a DS3 or an OC, an OC3 or, or higher service, it's all symmetric, but it's more expensive. So just by way of example, uh, you can get Fios service from Verizon for 50 or $60 a month, but I've been arm wrestling for a symmetric DS3 45 megabit service, but they want $2,200 a month for that. That's a fairly dramatic difference in charging. Um, so we're still arm wrestling over that. 
it is uh, Im almost impossible to characterize in a brief way the social and economic impact of the Internet so far. But one of the most profound has become very evident in the last three or four years, and that is that the consumers of information, that's you and me, are in fact becoming the producers of information. You see this with YouTube, you see this with blogging, you see this with Facebook, you see it with many of the social network applications where people are generating information as well as consuming it. Uh, in some sense, Internet has become one of the most democratizing mechanisms for the uh, creation of content and for providing people with access to it. And I am, uh, feel uh, compelled to mention that the Internet Society, which was started in 1992, has as its motto, the Internet is for everyone. Of course, we know that not everyone has access to it yet. But the intent is that everyone should, and that ultimately they will become both consumers and producers of its content. There are, I think, enormous and unexplored opportunities for education in the context of the Internet. I won't take a lot of time to try to detail that in this uh, discussion this afternoon, but I do think that we need to move uh, not away from, but we need to augment the traditional kinds of education which you're uh, entertaining today, uh, where you have people lecturing to you. It's a kind of a residential environment. You come to school, you're here full time. Uh, eventually, uh, I think it will be very clear that we cannot end our educations with our degrees. That especially if you're taking uh, classes or planning a career in a technical discipline, the rate at which the technology is changing and the rate at which the, the half-life of the information which you have uh, is, gets shorter and shorter and means you have to continue to refresh your knowledge and awareness of what's happening in technical fields. And so Internet theoretically has a role to play in that because it should be uh, a, a tool by which you can continue to learn and continue to explore, continue to interact with people who are creating or who are part of the development of new technologies. Internet's also illustrating some very new business models, and it's, it's turning out to be quite dramatic uh, for, uh, for some of the traditional businesses. Just to give you a very concrete example of this, a few months ago I purchased a terabyte of memory to use at home for $1,000. Now I was in Poland uh, last week and somebody popped up in the audience and said, I only paid $300 for my terabyte of memory, so obviously I went to the wrong place. But the fact is that in 1979 I spent $1,000 for a 10 megabyte disk drive that was about the size of a shoebox. And to be honest with you, in 1979, I was pretty excited about having 10 megabytes of storage available because the only other alternative was a five and a quarter inch disk drive that had 100 kilobytes of, of storage on it. So, you know, you can do the math. That was a lot of five and a quarter inch disks. But if you also do the math and ask, what would it have cost me to buy a terabyte of memory in 1979? The answer is $100 million, although this Polish guy could probably get it for $30 million. In any case, <laughs> I didn't have $100 million in 1979, and if I had, I still don't, by the way, but if I had had $100 million in 1979, I'm very sure my wife wouldn't let me spend it on disk memory. So uh, here we are in 2007, and we're seeing uh, memory costs dropping precipitously. Uh, that, what that means is that the cost of storage, and by the way, the cost of transmission, have dramatically reduced over that uh, 20 or 30 year period. And it has caused some really interesting things to happen. Let's imagine for the sake of argument that you're planning to um, build a warehouse and you're going to house a, a million different CDs in it, music and, and maybe uh, DVDs for video. And the, the idea is to have a very large inventory with a very large choice for your customers. First of all, it's going to take a lot of room to store a million of these physical things. Second, you won't reach more than a certain limited market with a physical warehouse and storefront. If you want to reach a larger market, you're going to have to keep building more and more of these things. On the other hand, if you put all this up on the net, then you can store it once and deliver it to anyone who needs it. And in fact, of course, that's what iTunes is all about at Apple. The cost of storage and the cost of transmission have inverted the basic business model and they really dictate not to build physical facilities and not to build physical copies of things, but rather to keep them in digital form and deliver them in that way. Now, of course, there are all kinds of issues associated with intellectual property protection, and we'll come back to that, but the, the economics right now are really quite dramatic. 
The same thing can be said for print material, that the cost of printing physical material and distributing it and housing it and so on is quite dramatically higher than the cost of keeping things in digital form. This doesn't mean that the paper print business is going to evaporate overnight. I mean, there are some nice things about books. You know, they don't, their batteries don't die, for example, uh, whereas uh, certain other kinds of devices can uh, surprise you when you, just when you got to the good part. So uh, I don't think that paper is going to evaporate at all, but I do think that there will be choices for people. And experiments have demonstrated that if you can get both online and uh, hard copy, sometimes you get both because there are times when it's convenient to read one way versus the other. As these infrastructures evolve, of course, uh, they become part of the general public's uh, tool set. And you and I and a billion other people are all part of that. And of course, the side effect of making these things, uh, these technologies available to everyone is that suddenly the user base is all of us. It is the society that we live in. And so all the bad things about society emerge out of this environment. Uh, which before was more homogeneous, it was primarily academic 20 or 30 years ago. So we get spam, we get viruses and worms, we get social abuses, we have people deliberately putting misinformation into the system, we have people committing fraud. It's not any different than any other infrastructure. People commit fraud with the postal service, they commit fraud with the telephone system, uh, they commit fraud face to face if they have an opportunity to do that. And we've chosen to treat some of those kinds of behaviors as socially unacceptable. We even say, if we catch you doing that, we'll punish you. We might fine you, we might put you in jail. Internet is no different, except for one thing. It is absolutely global in scope. The jurisdiction of our laws tends to be limited to domestic jurisdiction. There's a term called extraterritoriality, which generally speaking, you don't have uh, access to. Your court in, uh, in uh, Champaign-Urbana or the federal courts in the United States cannot reach out, in the absence of treaty agreements, cannot reach out in order to punish someone who harmed an American but did so on foreign soil. So there are serious problems trying to enforce social norms that involve abuse of this technology, and it's going to take treaty kinds of agreements. You know, you've heard about the law of the sea. It may be that we have to consider something like the law of the net. And I can tell you, it took 20 years to get to the point where we had a treaty having to do with the uses of the ocean, so it may take that long to get to the point where we actually have international agreements on uh, misuse of the net, although there may be some specific things about which we all might agree earlier on, in which case we might see some specific kinds of treaties on those points. Uh, I want to emphasize how important it has been that the net has been so open uh, and easily accessed for the last uh, 30 years or so. The fact that you can try things out without having to get permission from an ISP or permission from a telco is really important. Uh, when uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin started Google, they didn't have to get permission from someone to offer this service. They just put it up and let people try it out. The same is true for Amazon and for Yahoo and for eBay and for Skype and for Juice and for many of the other uh, applications. Uh, the games that people play, the Second Life or the World of Warcraft, are all examples of innovation at the edge of the net that it were not inhibited by access uh, to it because the providers, at least up until now, uh, did not interfere with people's attempts to offer new kinds of services. And finally, I would say that as the network has expanded and reached different parts of the world, that we found the need for localization where people can be comfortable using the net in, in languages that they're familiar with, uh, they may have different kinds of cultural norms that dictate different kinds of interfaces and different styles of, of operation. Uh, and these things are all becoming quite evident. That's why Google, for example, has been opening up engineering offices around the world to take advantage of skilled engineers who also have a knowledge of local language and culture, and they can bring that knowledge to adapt some of the products and services to where they live. I've already mentioned mobile several times. So I don't want to over emphasize this, but what you are finding is that these devices are, in fact, powerful computers in and of them, uh, in their own right. Uh, many people who have GSM capability, especially outside the U.S., and now increasingly in the U.S., will use these things for short messaging. You can think of it as instant messaging, if you like. Uh, there are a lot of kids who prefer instant messaging and short messaging to email because they consider email to be old-fashioned and slow. Uh, and in some respects, it is old-fashioned because it was invented in 1971. Uh, some, many of these devices are being used for payment systems now, especially in Europe and increasingly in third-world countries 
where getting access to the banking system has been a real challenge. There are people who don't have bank accounts, but they do have mobiles. And so creating value out of minutes for mobiles and allowing people to trade minutes around as a medium of exchange is turning out to be a very interesting way of allowing commerce to occur in places where there really isn't any other money. There isn't any place to put it. There are no banks. So uh, that's starting to turn into quite a very interesting evolution in and of itself. Yeah, this is a challenging device to work with. I mean, when you think about it, it's got a display that's about the size of a 1928 television set. Uh, it has varying data rates, uh, you know, from maybe from 16 kilobits a second up to maybe 80 to 100 or sometimes even 500 kilobits a second. And it's got a keyboard which is suitable for people that are three inches tall. So uh, it's a challenge for companies like Google and others who are trying to build useful software with this kind of limited interface in it. But I want to suggest something to you um, which has a lot to do with the way we think about how we interact with the network. Many of us probably think mostly about having interactions one device at a time. So I'm using my laptop to interact with the net now. I'm using my mobile to interact with the net because my laptop isn't available. It's one device at a time. But imagine walking into a hotel room finding a high-quality digital display, which most of them seem to have now, finding an infrared or uh, Bluetooth keyboard, typically for web TV, but having them all internet-enabled so that this device can actually use the large display and use the large keyboard. So in a sense, you walk in with your core computing capability, but its interfaces are not limited to this device anymore. It can use things that are around it that are also part of the net. So I would like to stimulate people thinking about multiple device use of the net, all of these things on the internet at the same time, uh, and being brought together in an ensemble to provide a service to a user. The other thing which is quite interesting is that these devices are becoming GPS enabled, or in Europe, perhaps someday they'll be Galileo enabled, or for that matter, GLONASS enabled in Russia. Um, these things know where they are, or they can know where they are, which leads to interesting scenarios. For example, you can imagine sitting in your car, talking to a computer with your mobile. Since the mobile is in the car, it can get access to the local net of the car, it could be wireless. It gets access to the positioning information that the car has because it has a GPS receiver. Uh, it knows about the navigational display, because that's another internet-enabled device. So you're talking to a computer on the internet saying, where's the nearest ATM machine? That computer can understand the question, not just the text, but it makes sense because along with the voice signal comes the information about where you were when you asked the question. So now the database has what it knows in order to figure out how to get the answer. It goes to a geographically indexed database, comes back and tells you it's two blocks up and to the right. And then, because this device sent the internet address of the, of the navigational display, it sends a map to that internet device so you can see what the path is. You can imagine asking questions like, where's the nearest restaurant? What's the, uh, the menu look like? Can I place an order? Can I make a reservation? So these kinds of devices are making localization and geographically indexed information of increasing value. And this fact has not been lost on Google, as I'm sure you all know. Many of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with Google Earth, the typical screenshot that you get when you start it up. This is an overhead shot of the area where I live in northern Virginia. It's called Tyson's Corner. And although I doubt you'll be able to see what's up there when I, uh, when I show this slide, actually there's a lot of text that just popped up on the display. It's part of the Google uh, community information. These are people who know the area that you're looking at and have uploaded information about the buildings in the area or other sites of, of interest in the area, you can click on, the, uh, on these little uh, text string icons and a window will pop up to tell you more about what's going on there. So it could be about restaurants or banks or stores or other kinds of activities that could be of interest. The reason I bring this up is that it illustrates the value of building application programming interfaces that allow others who are part of the network environment to share their information with everyone else. So Google doesn't actually know about all this, except that the information has gotten into the uh, Google Earth database, and it can be presented on demand to users who are interested in it. This opens up a lot of opportunities for information sharing and knowledge sharing that otherwise wouldn't be easily available. There's another 
element to, uh, to all of this, and that's the information which is locked up in print, but which is not available in any way online. Now, one thing I want to emphasize uh, at this point is to distinguish between having knowledge of what is in print, including full indexes of the text of a printed object, and actually delivering that object online in full text form. Those are two completely distinct things. We're interested at Google in helping people know what books are available and what content they have in them. If you've ever stood in front of your personal library and known that there is a book in there that has something in it that you want, but you can't remember which book, the, the likelihood that you would find it by going through every single book one page at a time is zero. But if the books were indexed as to full content, then Google might be able to help, and that's what we'd like to do. But I want to emphasize that we are not trying to put the books up online in full text form for delivery to users unless the copyright holders give us permission to do that. So the book search is intended to help people understand what's available. And then, of course, they may have to find the book in the library or buy it at a bookstore or go to Amazon or borrow it from a friend or maybe even pull it out of your own bookshelf at home. So there's a large, an argument going on right now about whether indexing is, in fact, a fair use of the book's content or whether somehow it's a violation of copyright. There isn't agreement on that interpretation, and so there's continued uh, debate, and some of, them, some of the debate shows up in court cases. There is a, a, a growing belief in some parts of the Internet world that the current copyright structures are too constraining, that they don't give very many options to the producers of content to share that information under certain varying terms and conditions. Lawrence Lessig at Stanford University has developed what he calls the Creative Commons, which is a framework in which authors can share or producers uh, or composers of music or producers of videos can share the content that they've produced under varying terms and conditions. The purpose here is to offer as broad a range of options to these producers as possible, including the possibility of remuneration for having offered that information on the net. Uh, a lot of authors are very much interested in being able to self-publish. In fact, they don't like the idea of having to sign away all of their uh, copyrights to a publisher. And in fact, the technology of putting things online changes in some ways, pulls the rug out from under the traditional print publishing model, which is expensive for just production and distribution, but in the online world, that expense disappears. There's still an expense associated with editing. There's still an expense associated with publicizing and, and marketing. So I'm not trying to argue that book publishers do nothing except print and distribute, but that piece of their cost goes away. The Creative Commons may offer a broader range of ways in which publishers can uh, help authors reach an audience. And finally, I wanted to mention something about um, technology for distribution of digital content. Many of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with the things I put up here, like BitTorrent and Napster and Kazaa. Uh, the point I want to make here is to distinguish between the technology and its abuse. For a while, especially uh, the music world and uh, more recently the video world, was quite worried that all of these technologies would solely be used for copyright violation. That there was synonymous, uh, that, that the use of BitTorrent was synonymous with copyright violation, or the use of Kazaa or Napster was synonymous with copyright violation. In fact, we know that's not true, uh, and in fact, the uh, video producers or mu uh, movie producers have already figured out that there's something really good about the, the distribution of information in digital form. It's a lot less expensive than building 35 millimeter canisters of film and shipping them by FedEx or what have you. So they're now licensing the technology from BitTorrent and using it to distribute their content, generally speaking, suitably encrypted so that people have to buy a key in order to watch the movie. But the idea here is that the economics are driving the industry towards an online environment. So just generally speaking, I expect there are going to be billions of devices on the network. Some of them, frankly, I never anticipated would be on the net, like refrigerators with uh, you know, nice liquid crystal displays that are touch sensitive. I don't know about you, but uh, many families in the United States have a family communication system that's made up of magnets and paper. It's all covering the front of the refrigerator. So the uh, internet-enabled refrigerator augments that with uh, you know, web pages and blogging and email and instant messaging and the like. 
Then there's internet-enabled picture frames that wake up and download images from well-defined websites because each picture frame has a unique ID. Uh, we use these in our family. We all have digital cameras, so we upload pictures of the nieces and the nephews and the grandchildren. You get up in the morning and you look at the picture frame to see what the family's doing around the country. Of course, those of you who are uh, interested in security will appreciate that um, um, if the website that the uh, picture frame is downloading stuff from is hacked, uh, the grandparents may see pictures of what they hope is not the grandchildren, uh, in which case we understand that security is just as important at home as it may be at work. Uh, telephones that are actually voice over IP devices, uh, actually this was predictable. Uh, and in fact, we were doing voice over IP experiments as far back as 1975. Now I have to tell you, the internet backbone in 1975 was running at a blazing 50 kilobits per second. And if you uh, remember, voice, digitized voice typically takes about 64 kilobits a second to transmit. So right away you know you're not going to carry a whole lot of voice on a 50 kilobit backbone. Of course, we knew we were doing this for the military and we knew that they could accept a certain degradation in the voice signal. So we used a compression technique which modeled the voice tract as a stack of uh, cylinders, uh, ten, 10 cylinders high that were changing their diameter as you excited the voice tract with a formant frequency. And by sending only the uh, diameters of the cylinders periodically, you could uh, get the signal down to 1800 bits per second. And then, of course, the software on the other side inverted that process and produced sound. It turns out that speaking through a system like that made everyone sound like a drunken Norwegian. And uh, there came a day when I had to demonstrate this thing to a bunch of generals at the Pentagon, and I remember thinking, okay, how am I going to do this? Then I remembered that one of the participants in the voice experiment was the uh, Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. So we asked Ingvar to be the speaker, and we had him speak through the ordinary telephone system, and then we had him speak through the voice over IP system, and it sounded exactly the same. <laughs> uh, so we didn't tell the generals that everybody would sound that way when they uh, used it. I still think the most remarkable uh, thing to show up on the net is an internet-enabled surfboard. Some guy in San Diego was sitting out waiting for the next wave thinking, you know, if I had a laptop on my surfboard, I could be surfing the net while I'm waiting for the next wave to surf on the Pacific Ocean. So he stuck a laptop in his surfboard, put a Wi-Fi service back in the uh, rescue shack on the beach, and now he sells this as a product in, uh, in San Diego. So there are going to be billions of these things, more, probably more devices than there are people. I mean, if you think about how many devices you have now that are internet enabled, that are at home or in the office or on, in the car or maybe you carry them around on your body, uh, you walk into a hotel, you see web TVs and things like that. Uh, video games are many of them internet enabled and people coordinate their, uh, their actions as a group with, with uh, voice communication. So I got to thinking some more about, you know, what would the world be like if all of our refrigerators were internet enabled? And it occurred to me that if we were using RFID chips, you know, these uh, radio frequency identifying, identification devices, and if we had the RFID chips in the packages that we put in the refrigerator, and if the refrigerator had an RFID detector, then it would know what it has inside of it. So while you're at school or at work, it could be surfing the net looking for recipes that it could make with what it knows it has inside. When you get home, you'd see a nice list of things for dinner. Of course, uh, you could extrapolate this a little more. You could be on vacation and you get an SMS from your refrigerator. It says, I don't know how much milk is left, but you put it in there three weeks ago and it's going to crawl out on its own. Or, uh, you know, maybe you're shopping and uh, you get an email and it's from your refrigerator saying, uh, don't forget the marinara sauce, everything else I need for spaghetti dinner tonight. Now, the Japanese have spoiled the whole thing. They've invented an internet-enabled bathroom scale. And so you step on the scale and it figures out which family member you are based on your weight and sends that information to the, which, you know, that doesn't seem too awful, except that the refrigerator is on the same network. <laughs> so you come uh, went up on Easter weekend. So uh, when Charles was on his way up, he was wearing clothing that was fully instrumented so that they could keep track of his vital signs. And this is actually becoming an increasingly common thing in the medical profession to keep track of people's conditions without having to physically wire them uh, to, uh, to a bed. Uh, it's all radio-based. So you can imagine having internet-enabled clothing. So I got to thinking, well, what could you do with your clothes if they were internet-enabled? Well, let's see. You could send an SNMP packet to the sock drawer and interrogate it as to its current state, and you get back a report saying there's a, you know, 17 matched pairs of socks, except sock number 144L is missing. So you'd send a multicast message around the house, you get back a message back saying, hello, this is sock 144L, I'm under the sofa in the living room. 
So we've just solved the problem of the missing sock, which I think is a huge contribution to, uh, to society. Now, you, those of you who are engineers, and I suspect we're computer scientists, will appreciate that you really have to pay attention to the implications of what you design. So let's take another scenario. Um, you know, you've got your internet-enabled clothing, and uh, you, uh, you get online, and you instant message your significant other saying, hi, honey, I'm going to be working late in the lab tonight. And there's a brief pause, and you hear the clicking of keys. And she says, well, sweetheart, that's very nice to know, but your shirt seems to be down at 19th Street at the bar. So maybe this idea of having internet-enabled clothing is a really dumb idea, and we shouldn't do this at all. Well, there's other possibilities, but we don't have time to talk about them right now, maybe when we get to Q&A. Uh, I just want to emphasize how much more in control users are today than they ever have been in the past. Uh, users do their own searching. They are the ones who drive the discovery process. They are the ones who initiate transactions on the network. They are not passive recipients of content. They announce information that they want people to know. They share information they produce. They collaborate with other people. They produce uh, content. Self-service has become a very, very natural and important part of Internet. Companies can no longer get away with, hi, our office hours are from 9 to 5. People are serviced all around the world in all time zones. They're expecting to get attention at any time. FedEx, for example, as I'm sure many of you already know this, will tell you where they last saw your package if you have the shipping number. You notice how carefully I phrase that. They don't know where it is. They know where they last saw it, and that, but at least that's you know, better than not knowing anything at all. Uh, people have become so accustomed to getting information online when they want it that governments are beginning to understand that this is also true of the citizen who wants government services and expects to get them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, I've already talked about users being the producers and consumers of information. We're also seeing emerging out of the net communities of interest uh, in many social networking settings, MySpace and Facebook and Orchid and Google Groups and so on, and the games like World of Warcraft or Second Life. All of these uh, are, uh, are systems that draw people together who have common interests. And I think that, uh, that this is becoming an important additional element in the Internet's environment, which is bringing communities of interest together across international boundaries. The net, in fact, does not know anything about international boundaries at its lower layer. Certainly up at the, uh, the layer of the domain name system, there's distinguishable uh, domain names for country codes, but then there are the generic domain names which don't know anything about country boundaries at all, like com and net and co-op and so on. Here's a big problem. Uh, there is an increasing amount of information on the network, and it's becoming harder and harder to index it in a way which is useful for searching and retrieval. Today, most of the searching mechanisms are syntactic in their character. They're matching strings or instances of strings, uh, and they don't really know what the meaning is of the words. If, if you knew that Jaguar had two meanings, either a car or an animal, and if you knew the context in which Jaguar is used in content on the net, you might be able to help someone search for the animal uh, or the automobile, but exclude the others because that wasn't what you were looking for. Today, it's very hard to do. We also don't know really how to index video and uh, audio and imagery. We can index text, but it's hard to find similar pictures or matching pictures or matching audio uh, or similar audio or similar imagery. So that's an area of uh, serious research. Another thing which I would observe to you is that location has become an important indexing tool. That's why the geographically indexed information is so valuable. We haven't used time as much. Uh, we use it to organize, for example, email so that you get the most recent thing first. But you can imagine having both time and location indexing of content so that you could know about events that have happened in the past. And you could ask about, well, what happened when I'm looking at this Google Earth image? What happened here 50 years ago? or 25 years ago, or perhaps even what is going to happen you know, next year, or next month, or next week, because you're looking at scheduled events, or you're looking for scheduled events. Of course, I'm not suggesting that we can foretell the future, except insofar as it is planned, uh, and therefore you can talk about what people are intending. So this notion of using both time and location as an indexing operation is interesting, and of course it raises the question, what other kinds of organizing paradigms might we want to use and apply? to the information that's on the net. Finally, I'd want to mention something that worries me a great deal. 
As time goes on, more and more information is going to flow into the internet. But I want you to imagine that it's the year 3000, and you've just done a Google search, and you've turned up a PowerPoint file that was produced in 1997. So the first question is, does PowerPoint 3000 know how to interpret a 1997 PowerPoint file? I would bet the likelihood is close to zero. So, and I don't mean to pick on, uh, on Microsoft here at all, uh, in particular, this would be true even if we were using open source techniques because over time those um, formulas, those, uh, those organizing structures, data structures, are going to evolve depending on the kind of information that we have uh, in the data that we've stored away. So I worry that there's a kind of information decay or bit rot that will set in over time and the information that we've gone so much to so much trouble to accumulate on the net will wind up becoming less and less useful because we won't know how to interpret it. So this raises some interesting questions. Do we have to retain the ability to run old software? Do we have to get the rights to do that? Do we have to get the rights to run the operating system that knew how to run the old software? Where does that end? Do we need to get hardware that's online or do we have to emulate the hardware base that knew how to run the operating system, that knew how to run the application, et cetera? I don't know the answer to that, but we need to think hard about this so that we don't end up accumulating huge amounts of digital information that we can't use anymore because we don't know how to interpret it. I'm gonna skip over this. Let me finish up uh, by giving you a quick uh, summary of where we are in another project. This is not, by the way, a Google project. So I don't want you to walk out of the auditorium saying, aha, Google's model, business model is to take over the solar system. That's not about, that's not what Google is all about. This is a project that Google allows me to continue to work on at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Now you know that we've instrumented planet Earth pretty thoroughly and we're going to have to keep instrumenting it more thoroughly as we worry about climate change and global warming. Uh, we're very interested in Mars and what conditions it has had in it in the past, what its current state is, and whether or not it could support life or has ever supported life. Uh, we've been using something called the Deep Space Network to communicate with spacecraft that are either going in orbit around the planets or flying past the asteroids or in some cases actually landing on the surface like the 1997 Pathfinder did on Mars, sending back literally hundreds if not thousands of very, very useful images from the surface of Mars. And more recently, of course, we put two rovers on Mars. They are still in operation, which is pretty amazing because they all landed three years ago. And the original expectation was that these would last for about 90 days. Uh, the reason that they've lasted longer, is a closer look at one of them, is that the solar panels have actually worked more effectively and longer than we expected. Those are the big black wing-like looking things on the, uh, on the vehicle. Uh, these solar panels were expected to get dustier and dustier over time, and the more dust is on them, the less effective they were at converting sunlight into electricity. Eventually, the batteries would not charge up sufficiently so that over one Martian night, it, you might never wake up again because you didn't have enough power during the period of time when there is no sunlight. What's actually happened is that the solar panels have stayed cleaner than we expected. Now, just between us, I think there's somebody up there dusting them off, but we haven't actually caught them on the video, so you know, that's probably not a very supportable explanation. The more likely explanation is that there are dust devils, the little dust storms that take place on the surface of Mars, and they are happening in both sites of rover spirit and opportunity and what happens is that when the dust uh, devils happen when the wind blows it actually blows the dust off of the surface so if you're sitting in the um, uh, rover control center at the jet propulsion lab in pasadena you can actually see the voltage levels go up as these dust devils blow the dust off of the solar panels so these things have managed to survive for quite some time one of them has a, a broken, mechanically broken wheel, so it's kind of dragging furrows in the Martian uh, desert sand. Uh, eventually, these things will stop physically functioning. They, they, they won't uh, mechanically work, but they may actually still retain their computing and communications and storage capabilities, which might allow them to be reused and repurposed for other things. Now, what you may not know is that uh, we've got orbiters around uh, Mars, four of them, uh, one of the most recently going into operation is the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. The Global Surveyor has been there for a decade and just stopped working just uh, a few months ago. The Mars Express and Mars Odyssey are still in operation. And in fact, uh, the radios on board the rovers uh, were originally intended to transmit data straight back to Earth on the deep space network. 
uh, it turns out that the data rates that were sustainable using the direct-to-earth path was about 28 kilobits a second. But when we turned the radios on, they overheated after 20 minutes, and we had to turn them off to keep them from damaging themselves. So the duty cycle of transmission direct to Earth was actually limited, and it was low data rate. So the engineers at JPL got together and said, well, why don't we use a different radio that's on board the rovers that can't go all the way back to Earth, but it could reach up to an orbiter because it's much closer, and it could operate at higher data rates. So they reprogrammed Mars Odyssey in particular to accept transmissions at 128 kilobits a second up, it stores the data, and then as the orbiter gets around in its orbit where it can see the deep space network, it bursts the data out again at 128 kilobits a second. 95% of all the data that is coming from the rovers is now coming through this store and forward technique. What you may also not know is that for almost all of its history, the deep space network has been used since 1964 to communicate with these spacecraft but each spacecraft is different. Each one has its own complement of sensors. And in order to use the very limited data resources that are available, they've actually programmed the communications uh, software to be fairly unique to each one of the um, sensor systems. So the end result of all this has been that there isn't any standardization of communication among the spacecraft that are out there. That means that when you finish a particular mission, and the resources are still functional, it's hard to use them to support new missions because there isn't any standardization. So the engineers at JPL and I got together back in 1998 and said, what would happen if we standardized the communications used in deep space missions so that every time you launch a new mission, you could use previous mission assets if they were available to help augment uh, that particular mission's requirements. And in fact, that's what we've done. Although we started out thinking we could use standard inter you know, internet as a way of, uh, of standardizing the communications in space, that idea lasted about a week. And you can sort of see why this isn't gonna work. Uh, the first problem is that the distance between the planets is literally astronomical. And at the speed of light, it takes anywhere from three and a half to 20 minutes to get from Earth to Mars, depending on where we are in our respective orbits. So we have a round trip time problem. It could be up to 40 minutes of round trip time. Can you imagine trying to run TCP with a round trip time of 40 minutes? You know, the flow control doesn't work because the way it normally works is you say stop when your buffers are full. And in this case, for 20 minutes, the guy is gonna keep pumping data at you because he hasn't even heard you say stop yet. So you know, that doesn't work very well. Then there's a little problem of celestial motion. You're trying to talk to a rover on Mars, and Mars is rotating, and pretty soon the rover disappears, and you can't talk to it until it comes back around again. And so we've got disruption as well. The end result of all that is that we had to develop a new set of protocols that we call delay and disruption tolerant networking in order to accommodate the interplanetary part of the system. So we use internet standards on board the spacecraft. We use internet standards on the surface of the planets, like we do here on Earth. And then we shift over into this DTN interplanetary networking when we're running between planets. So that stuff is now at the point where it's getting a lot of testing terrestrially. We're going to be testing using the same system that's used to communicate with the International Space Station and the shuttle uh, later this year. By the end of 2008, we hope to have uh, some uh, contents on board or systems on board the space shuttle for testing. Then we're going to use deep, the uh, deep impact mission whose resources are still available to do deeper space testing of the protocols. And then finally, uh, if the rovers eventually stop physically uh, being able to move around, NASA has said that we could, might be able to get access to the rovers and reprogram the, to run uh, interplanetary networking protocols on board those things. So what we're hoping, frankly, is that NASA will adopt these new standards as part of their uh, complement of standard communication procedures. And then as each new mission is launched, uh, it will have these standards on board and will accumulate a kind of deep space backbone network uh, over a period of many decades. So at least by the end of 2010, we expect to have a two-planet internet in operation between Earth and Mars, and as the subsequent missions go out, uh, building an interplanetary backbone one mission at a time. So that's an up-to-date report on where we are on the interplanetary net. I'll stop there. That's the, all the formal remarks I have. I'm very happy to try to respond to questions that you might have. Uh, I think we, the plan is to have some microphones uh, up nearby here for people who want to interact. So thank you again for allowing me to take part of your afternoon.
So there are two mics if people want to ask questions. Oh, you have to come all the way up here where I can spit on you. Okay. <laughs> We've got another one over there. You're on. Yes. Go ahead. Um, so, my question is actually back to the uh, when you had the slide about like the predictions of you know what other devices could actually go uh, could actually be internet enabled. And you were talking about like um, uh, smartware and, and and like fridges and scales and stuff like that. And um, I guess when we take a look back at like how the internet became so popular, I think at least personally one of the most appealing things about it was. And I guess this is the same thing for a lot of people: is that uh, you're, you know, the anonymity of, of the internet itself. You're, uh, you know, a lot of people. It's it's very common for people to assume different uh, identities, to um, have different profiles, even on the same uh, site or on the same network. So how, I mean, how this whole thing of uh, now your actual, you know, your actual data is, is is attached to you because this is the kind of service it's providing for you. You know, it has to be attached to you. How, you know, how do you think this? How do you think that like people will generally react to this thing? Um, I don't know. Like, let, uh, let me let me make sure that I'm getting the basic drift. Are you asking about how we identify ourselves unequivocally in this network environment so that we have strong authentication, or are you asking something different from that? Because that's that's the impression I'm getting from you yeah. is you're wondering how do I how do I personalize services? How am I sure that uh, the, the services that I'm getting are the ones that I'm supposed to be getting and not someone else? Yeah. How do I make sure that someone else isn't impersonating me and taking services away from me? Is that, is well, that where I, you're I, I guess this is part of like the you know, technical, uh, actual research and security, right? Uh, but I think, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, like, um, will people uh, accept the fact that, uh, or, you know, will this, will this be a barrier to people, uh, to the spread of this smartware and other internet-enabled devices, it, if, that, you know, the information is actually now attached to you rather, you know, will people accept, you know, I'm losing my anonymity, for getting more information. Okay, so uh, actually, I, I'm, what I'm uh, getting from this is a mixture of several different issues. One of them is a privacy question. If I'm interacting with this thing and my information is out there, how do I protect my privacy? Uh, the second, uh, am I, uh, how, how do I deal with identity theft, for example? So there, this is the longer, the answer to this is longer than we have time to do right on the spot, but I will suggest several things. First of all, uh, I don't think we would want to have a single unique identity uh, in the net. Some people have suggested that everyone should have, you know, when you're born, you get this thing you know, on your forehead. I resist that for the obvious reason that there's a lot of abuse associated with collecting and accumulating and correlating information about people. There's a big privacy hazard there, uh, and it shows up in financial questions and health information and everything else. You have multiple identities now. Uh, if you look at your credit cards, you have more than one identity in effect, and it keeps changing over time, which is a good thing, because that means that you can't uh, uh, take a large body of information accumulated over a long period of time and somehow associate it with a single set of numbers. Um, and so that, this principle of being able to uh, reissue identity is, uh, is actually a good one, because it means if you lose your identity, like losing your credit card, you can reestablish it with a new one, and it isn't unusual. So there's, that's one area where I think it's useful. Um, imagine for just a moment, well, I'm sorry, I was going to go down the public key crypto path for a minute, and there's a whole scenario here that, that involves uh, building up confidence in who you're interacting with. Let's, let's try that. Suppose that that I'm offering a service and you come to me and you say, hi, I'm Joe and, and here's my public key. Of course, my first reaction to this is, well, prove it. And so I challenge you with a random number. You respond with an encrypted uh, version of that number using my public key. Yes. Uh, and I can, I can verify that, uh, I'm sorry, you use your private key, you encrypt the result, send it back, I'll use your public key in order to decrypt it. So now I know, all I know is you're Joe and you have a private key that matches a public key and that's all I know about you. And we have this interaction and maybe this goes on for a period of time. I'm accumulating a record of this guy named Joe who keeps reintroducing himself and authenticating the same way, hi, I'm Joe, and I say prove it, and we do that little dance. And then one day you come to me and say, I want to borrow 
And my first reaction is, well, I have this nice history of interaction with you, but I don't know whether I trust you enough. I don't even know who you are yet, except for this history. So I might say, well, tell me some more about yourself. And you might say, well, I'm employed here, and I make this much money, and I owe this much money, and will you loan me the money? And my reaction to that is, well, and thank you for telling me all that. You digitally signed it, so I have some reason to believe it's still Joe telling me that. But I may have to go somewhere else to find out whether the Joe that I'm talking to can establish his bona fides from a third, trusted third party. The reason I go through this little scenario is that it's an example of how we can use basic cryptographic mechanisms to build up some confidence over time in our interactions with someone, only having to reveal, or you only having to reveal personal information at the point where the transaction demands it. I don't have to ask you for that up front. I think that there are techniques like that that will allow us to control where our information goes. Now, the last thing I want to, because we have other people ask questions, the last thing I want to point out here is that it is not enough to use technology to try to protect information. If, if you imagine cryptography and digital signatures solve all problems, uh, that would be wrong. In fact, you have to worry about company policies for information that they accumulate in the normal course of interacting with you. I used to work for a telephone company. They had information like your name and address and phone number and uh, maybe a billing uh, uh, mechanism from the bank. And oh, by the way, they had a lot of information about the phone calls you made, like what number did you call, when did you call, how long did you talk. Now that's all personal and private information. You rely on the company's policy to protect that as private information. It has nothing to do with cryptography, except perhaps as a tool for them to exercise the company's policy. So we have more than just technology problems to deal with in order to cope with the range of issues that I believe you're raising. And I think that it's important for those of us who go into the business world to recognize that policy is just as important as technology in order to make people comfortable that their private information is kept that way. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Maybe just Oh, I'm sorry. I've got people over here, so I'm going to run back and forth. Uh, this, is, this is part of the Google uh, health plan where you have to run back and forth on the stage. Yes, sir. Do you see the Internet's infrastructure changing much over the next few years? And if so, do you expect the change to be incremental, or do you expect uh, widespread but infrequent changes? Uh, I, d I actually do not think that we're going to see, um, th this gets to the how is the Internet going to evolve problem. IPv6 is a very good example of a painful, slow process of trying to get a new basic technology into the Internet. Internet's been evolving in many different ways, some of them very incremental. Speeder, speedier lines, things like that, new applications, new protocols. I don't see a gigantic transformation for the Internet. I see a kind of continuing evolution. This doesn't mean that there might not be a new thing which replaces the Internet. In fact, there's an initiative called the Clean Slate Initiative that NSF has been uh, sponsoring, and I'm going to talk about that tomorrow in the computer science lectures, uh, which I think is very healthy. But it may be that you can't get to where you might want to be by purely incremental steps. Internet came along at a time when the technology of packet switching was thought to be unlikely and maybe impossible or useless. Uh, and it took a fair amount of time to demonstrate otherwise. So I see two paths right now. One of them is continuing evolution. I think we really will get to V6 because we have to. I mean, we're going to run out of V4 around 2012. I mean, at this point, the numbers are on the wall. You can see them, you can see the consumption rates. I know where ICANN is going to be done allocating its uh, last major block to the regional internet registries. And then, of course, those will run out after a while. So I see that evolving, but I also see opportunities for people to step back and say, well, what would happen if we tried to solve the following other problems that have not been solved in the internet environment and might not be solvable without taking some very, very different uh, perspectives on the design. So I, I, you know, I'm actually hoping I'll live long enough to see what's next. Uh, but if not, at least the internet will serve for a reasonable number of decades while we're figuring out what else to do. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to go over here and then I'll come back. Yes, sir. So uh, you talked about network neutrality and about prioritizing certain having certain situations where it's important to pr prioritize traffic, like low latency applications. And I was wondering, you know, how do you strike a balance in between those two? Because it seems legitimate that someone would say, well, I really would like to do this low latency, low latency stuff, and I realize I'm using a lot of your network resources doing it, so I'm willing to pay. Uh, okay, so let's, seems... let's, let's try to balance this, because it's, uh, 
it's, it, this is a situation that's very worthy of uh, some analysis. The first point I would like to make is that no one is saying, certainly not me, that it should not be the case that you have to pay more for using more resource. So, for example, if the telco or uh, cable company says, uh, if you want 20 megabits a second, you pay more than if you get 2 megabits a second of, of capacity. I don't have any disagreement with that. I'd like to be assured that I'm actually getting the 2 megs or the 10 megs. I mean, that's a different story. But I, I, the net neutrality argument does not uh, argue against that. It doesn't even argue that you have to keep, treat every single packet in the system exactly the same. That's a distorted, a deliberately distorted view by people who don't want this neutrality argument to succeed. Uh, what we are saying, however, is that if you're going to offer differential services, that these differential services should be uh, available to everyone who is interested in them and should not be imposed. So, for example, uh, if, uh, if you're offering video services as a uh, broadband provider, as a value-added service, and there's a competitor that's offering video as a value-added service, and it happens that both of the streams are flowing on the same physical broadband facility that the broadband provider has, has provided, the argument the net neutrality people are saying is that, that the broadband provider should not be able to reach up and affect a competitor and favor their own traffic. The, they should be compensated for delivering capacity to the user, and the user should be willing to pay for that. But to uh, allow them to discriminate against a competitor is an anti-competitive uh, move and something which those of us in favor of net neutrality argue should be preserved. This used to be part of a common carriage theory of telecommunications. Unfortunately, the FCC abandoned the common carriage theory last year when it declared that Internet was an, was an application and not a communications infrastructure. I do not believe that that was the right answer, and I continue to believe that it was a serious mistake. If we had had lots of competition in broadband, if you had a choice of 10 different providers, then I would be a lot less concerned, because if you didn't like the service you were getting from one, you could go switch to somebody else. Switching broadband providers is really hard. If you've ever tried it, either you won't succeed or it will take a long time. Uh, in the earlier days of Internet, when Internet was dial-up, you could switch providers by changing the phone number you called to go to a different modem bank. That's all it took. And there was plenty of competition, literally thousands of Internet service providers across the United States. But now we've moved into a mode where we need higher capacity. It's not coming from very many different sources. Those sources are not competing with each other effectively. That translates, in my mind, into a regulatory requirement that you uh, insist on uh, egalitarian treatment of the underlying transport. So we have very strong disagreements with some of the telcos and cable companies on this, uh, on this question. So I hope I've gotten to the basic answer that you were looking for, but we are not, uh, those of us who are in favor of net neutrality are, are not stupid in the sense that we don't understand the need for uh, recovery of the cost of building broadband facilities. We just think that the way it should be done should be beneficial to the consumers, and the consumers should not be constrained in their ability to reach any service anywhere on the Internet with the capacity which they have paid for to get to the Internet from the broadband providers. Yes, sir? I always get nervous when I see somebody writing down something. This could be a long question. Go for it. I actually, I actually have two brief questions. My first question is, can you comment on the evolution of transport layer protocols for real-time traffic? We've I'm sorry, let's stop for just a second. You may not know this, but standing on the stage, what you don't get is good quality sound. What you get is all echo, because the system is designed, no, no, it's not your fault. I'm going to come down there, and right. too bad if the camera has a problem with that. <laughs> But I want to take advantage of the fact that I can hear better as well as you can by standing in the field of, uh, of the sound. speaker system. Go yeah, sure. for it. Um, my question was, there are a lot of applications today, for instance, Skype and Gtalk and other real-time applications. And uh, as all of us probably know, TCP and UDP are the two major transport protocols that are in use today to get traffic from one point to the other. But the problem is that neither one of these are really suited to the carriage of real-time traffic. So I'm kind of curious where you see that protocol evolution going for these kinds of things. 
Okay, that's actually an interesting question because a lot of people are getting very good service in spite of the fact that there isn't any special QoS uh, or maybe they're not even using RTP. Uh, to be dead honest with you, I think that we're more likely to end up with uh, adequate quality as long as we keep increasing the capacity of the system. The faster the speeds go, the lower the latencies, and the less you have a problem with this kind of low data rate, relatively low data rate real-time traffic. If you're talking about uh, streaming video, that's another discussion, and there's another twisted argument that's being made right now. And I'm, I'm going to answer a question you didn't ask, uh, which is, this is standard graduate student trick, right? You know, <laughs> professor asks a question, you twist it around so you can answer it. So I wanted to bring up streaming video. It's often used as an argument uh, that, uh, oh, somehow we are going to be uh, overwhelmed by all these uh, uh, video transmissions and we need to have huge capacity and, and somebody else has to pay for it. Um, if you had a gigabit per second access to the net, which you can get in Japan for 8,700 yen a month, or you can get in Stockholm for 100 euros a month, uh, which almost made me want to move to Stockholm or to Kyoto. Um, imagine when you're downloading, not streaming. In fact, that's too fast for streaming. It takes 16 seconds to download an hour's worth of video at a gigabit per second. So you're actually downloading stuff faster than you can watch it. You're doing that with iPod today. You're typically downloading music faster than you could listen to it because the data rates are uh, beyond what are needed for streaming sound. So I predict that people will tend to move towards the iPod or VPod style of operation where they'll download things and play them back. The reason they prefer that is first of all, they get to watch or listen to whatever they want to when they want to. Second, it actually puts less strain on the network. Because if it's a file transfer, you don't care whether the packets got out of order, one of them got lost, you could retransmit it. doesn't matter. All you need is to have a fully uh, complete file before you start playing the video or the audio back. Streaming was kind of disappeared. Stre stre yeah, streaming is a special case, which we will have to support. But if you look at all of the video that people watch today, I'm saying, careful now, I, video that people watch, about 85 to 90% of it has been pre-recorded. The reason that's important is that you can download as a file transfer that which has been pre-recorded. And it doesn't matter whether it's in real time, faster than real time, or slower than real time, it's still just a file. The real time stuff comes when you're looking at uh, uh, perhaps a sports event, maybe news, breaking news, or maybe an emergency. But the fraction of video that requires that treatment is de minimis compared to the amount of video that people actually watch, which they could have downloaded. So I'm predicting that this argument that we need special services for streaming video, and, and then arms are being waved about the quantity of it, because they're thinking about cable models and not thinking the iPod model. Uh, so I reject out of hand the argument that we're going to be killed by uh, video transmissions in real time because I don't believe we will be. Okay. okay, next question. Second question was, there are a lot of aggregators of personal information today. You mentioned a couple good ones like the phone company. Um, your own company is pretty good with that too. <laughs> they collect information. But um, the problem with this is that a lot of times with personal information theft, due to the nature of the crime, a response after the fact simply isn't appropriate when you have 100 million credit card numbers sitting in a database and they've been stolen because at that point you're potentially looking at 100 million people being affected by this. So I don't, I think this might be one of the particular problems where a market response isn't appropriate because it's too much of, it's too late after the fact already. So how, what do you think the best way to regulate that would be? Would there need to be a legal, a legal infrastructure created for, I guess, collectors of personal information or like regular policy audits or do nothing at all and just hope the market corrects for it or what? That's a, that's a really interesting question and I don't know that I have a, I don't have a glib answer for this. If you try to impose post hoc um, con constraints on the already existing aggregations, uh, you'll have squeals of, of screaming and yelling saying, well, we didn't design this system for that. On the other hand, protection of privacy uh, is sufficiently important that I can understand regulations saying that if you have private information, you have to protect it. In the European uh, Union, 
there are laws that, uh, that exactly apply, and they are applied retrospectively. Mm -hmm. So if I had a choice to protect privacy, I would tend to move in that direction, even though I'm sure there are people who argue uh, that this is a, an excessive cost. Uh, I should point out, though, that, uh, that Americans, anyway, have a tendency to give up an awful lot of privacy in exchange for convenience. So if you, if you look at your credit card annual report, which um, Amex or Visa or others will send to you, you'll notice that it has every expenditure you made by date and time, where you went, what airplane you were on, what restaurant you ate at, what bookstores you ordered books from. You might as well throw your diary away because they know an awful lot about what you did every day. And you know, so you look at that and you say, holy cow. And then you say, well, would you give up your credit card? And the answer is no, because it's too convenient. And it's not just the credit. I mean, it was the same thing would be true for a debit card. But it, for me, anyway, a lot of international travel, automatic conversions of currencies and everything else are a huge help. I do think, though, that we need to become very smart, smarter as a, as a society, about the amount of information that's accumulated about us. And we should care an awful lot that the legislators protect us with at the very least, post hoc protection, that is to say, if you can't prevent bad things from happening, if they do happen and we find out that you're responsible, there will be consequences. Okay, let me take one over here. I guess this way I'll just run back and forth in the aisle instead of going up and down <laughs> on the stage. Are we running out of time? Uh, can, we, can we do these remaining questions? Okay, so we'll do the rest of them. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, you talked a lot about the expansion of the internet and future expansion of the internet and even like a desire to read my PowerPoint 97 file in year 3000. But I guess as a side effect of that, uh, what do you think the dangers are of like internet bloat to a certain extent and do you see something like Google or search engines somehow being like a primary factor in mitigating whatever those negative effects might okay, be? Okay, well, so this is uh, you know, kind of roughly summarizing this question is are we going to have too much information in the net? Gosh, you know, I wonder whether Gutenberg was wondering about that 400 years ago when he invented this movable type printing press. I, I think the, the solution to the problem lie, the seeds to the solution lie in the technology. So I do not believe there's going to be an excessive amount of information that we can't cope with. Uh, and the reason for this is that we've already learned to cope with huge amounts of information. Let me just give you some concrete examples. You probably don't watch every television program produced. You've probably have not seen every movie produced. You don't read every book that's published. You don't read every magazine or every newspaper that's been printed. You don't read every website or every blog. You probably don't even read every email that comes in. Um, now, there is something going on there which has allowed you to decide that some things you're not going to bother with and other things are important to you. You've evolved some methods for evaluating what's important to you and what is not. The sources of information that help you do that include branding, you know, perhaps I'll read the New York Times, but I won't read this tabloid. Your friends who say, gee, have you seen this movie? Or gosh, you should read that book. Uh, when you're younger, maybe your parents. Uh, it may be uh, other sources of information that, uh, for example, uh, referee journals. Uh, you, you assume that there's been some work done to filter that information and make it more valuable and more useful to you. So we've already evolved in the other media mechanisms for coping with this huge amount of information. You might say, well, yes, but Google keeps returning you know, 700 billion uh, responses to my search, now what? And of course our answer is we're trying very hard to put the ones that are the most important at the top, but they might not be the ones that are most important to you. Okay, so this raises the bar in terms of relevance. And this is an area for people who are interested in research that we are quite interested in too trying to understand the semantics of questions, the semantics of content to, to get back uh, more relevant information to a query. But I don't believe that we should be panic struck, and, and I'm not trying to characterize your question that way, uh, that the amount of information is going to go up. If anything, because it's online and because it's machinable, we have a huge amount of computer power to augment our previous filtering techniques, which were largely human oriented. Okay. Uh, well, I, I'm speaking now as chairman of the board of ICANN, and I'm hoping very much to limit uh, the growth of responsibility at ICANN. It's not because I don't think the problems you're raising are important, because they are. 
but the question is whether the organization known as ICANN can, can actually absorb any more responsibility than it already has. At this point, it is only responsible for deciding what top-level domains will be admitted into the root and, what, um, and who will be allowed to operate a top-level domain, whether it's a CCTLD or, or a generic one. Uh, it decides what the rules are for registries and registrars to follow, and we have to enforce those rules better. Right now, there's a real consumer issue like Register Fly, which went under, that's uh, a major focus of attention. That's, that's within the scope of the organization, and we should be working hard. Although, I have to say that consumer protection is tough when you have a billion users, and we have 70 SAT. So we need to find ways of dealing with consumer protection that don't completely consume the ICANN uh, organization itself. That may mean reaching out to consumer protection agencies in other parts of the world, but I have to tell you that it's not so simple because if you have a problem here in Canada and someone has messed you up but they are based in, let's say, Germany, the consumer protection agency in Canada will say, buzz off because I don't have any jurisdiction over this German guy. We're back to thinking about international treaty-like structures which sometimes take a long time to develop, but that may be the only path by which we can get supranational support for consumer protection. I hope you've noticed that the uh, Uniform Dispute Resolution Policy is global in scope and does work across national boundaries because it, it is specific to um, in, individuals accepting um, dispute re alternate dispute re alternative dispute resolution mechanisms as opposed to using legal means, which always have certain jurisdictional constraints. So I frankly think that ICANN needs to be careful not to have its mandate expanded too far. The biggest thing we're worried about now, in addition to some of the spam and other things like that, we can't do much about. Fishing and farming, we can do something about with DNSSEC, and we're doing that right now. Uh, .se, the top-level domain for Sweden, and .bg, the top-level domain for Bulgaria, are now signing their top-level domain zone files, and that is a means for allowing your software to verify that, in fact, the information you got back mapping a domain name into an IP address is valid, as opposed to someone getting in the middle and falsifying the information. That will eliminate some kinds of phishing and farming uh, activity. Uh, but apart from those kinds of things, uh, getting very much deeper into, for example, content regulation, which is where we would have ended up, in my opinion, if we had approved the dot triple X proposal, uh, we didn't want to go there. At least the bulk of the board didn't want to go there because content regulation is hard and content regulation about what is obscene and what isn't is even harder. And it varies from one country and culture to another. So we absolutely had no business there, in my view. Okay, thank you for that. Good question. Last question. Last one. Hi. Yes, sir. Um, so I worked for British Telecom over the summer, and as you may be aware, they're replacing the public switch telephone network with all VoIP, which is kind of cool, actually, because one of the side effects is they went ahead and built quality of service across the entire network. So if you're a business, you can get a line that runs from one site to another, and your video conferencing will actually work and not be totally um, shut down by email and web browsing and DOS attacks and all those kinds of things. But the question I have is, do you think that quality of service internet-wide is a good thing? Is it worth the technical ramifications and the added complexity? And is that something that, that should be approached? Okay. Well, let me tell you what the Internet 2 folks said uh, in a Senate hearing on this subject. Uh, we were all impaneled, and that question was asked. The Internet 2 uh, researchers had spent two years experimenting with different kinds of QoS, and they announced that the only way they found that was effective was to simply increase the total capacity of the system in order to deliver better bandwidth and lower latency. Now, I used to work at a company called MCI, and on alternate Tuesdays, I had a different opinion. So on Tuesday number one, I would think, okay, let's look at this QoS thing. You know, maybe it would have some benefits. Uh, so we started to figure out, well, what would we do? And we said, well, all right, suppose we actually had differential kinds of quality of service, and we offered higher quality at a higher price. Uh-oh. Now we have to start keeping track of how much of the higher quality we actually delivered to somebody so we could charge them more for it. Uh, this is starting to sound like something in the telephone world that's called a call detail record. Call detail records are what we collect today in the telephone world uh, when we're not doing kind of free voice over IP. Uh, when I was at MCI, we collected 90 terabytes a month 
of call detail records. This required a substantial amount of processing just to figure out how much to charge people. And oh, by the way, the IBMs and the you know, HPs of the, of the world were really happy about the way we were doing this because we had to buy big iron in order to process it, which cost us money. So uh, you know, when you got all done doing all this, on the next Tuesday, you'd sit back and you say, let me see, what if I took all the money that I'd spent processing call detail records and buying computers and paying people and everything else, and I just put it into building a bigger net? And that looked pretty attractive. So to be very honest with you, I am, uh, I am personally over on the build a bigger net side of this equation, partly on the grounds that I've seen people using Skype in all kinds of circumstances, including dial-up, to considerable effect. Now, one thing that you might argue uh, about is that the current large-scale file transfers, which are typically video files, uh, are consuming on the order of about 75% of all the network's capacity right now. That if you look at, at the, all the data transfers that are going on, a huge fraction of them are BitTorrent or YouTube or some of the other kinds of, uh, of major video file transfers. Uh, the amount of capacity that you need for simple voice conferencing or voice communications is very small by comparison. Similarly, everything else, email and so on. So figuring out how to support large file transfers is probably the most important challenge given the current uses of the net. And of course it gets worse as the more data gets pushed in as well as pulled out. Uh, once again, this, this suggests to me that getting higher capacity is the key to the solution. And interestingly enough, the technology will deliver it. We can put multiple wavelengths on a single fiber. We can carry anywhere from 1.6 to 6.4 terabits per second on today's fibers using 10 gigabit to 40 gigabit per second per channel uh, transmissions. So there's nothing stopping us technologically, I think, from increasing capacity both in the core and at the edges of the net. It's the business models uh, and, the, frankly, the backward looking of some business models that are trying to recreate the cable television plant that are inhibiting our ability to deliver these higher capacities. That's why it's so frustrating to see places like uh, Japan and Sweden delivering gigabit per second services to customers because they can do it at reasonable prices. So I hope that somehow we have a few awakenings here in the United States so we all get to have the benefit of that kind of capacity. And that's all the time we got, I guess. So I'll turn this back Thank over you to you, Mark. Thanks. Thank you again. Appreciate it.